followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great, which made all the nations drunk, drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. Revelations 14 and 8. Now this is interesting because unlike the woman caught in the very act of adultery, which is really a typology of Israel, where she was broken in spirit and relented and repented, and Yeshua said, then go and sin no more. And this harlot says, I will not break. I am not poor. I am rich in every way, and I will not break. This is the harlot, Mystery Babylon. The repetition of Babylon the Great is fallen is fallen indicates the defeat of Babylon first in the spirit realm and then secondly in the physical realm. When Elohim executes judgment on a people, he does so both below and above, says the Zohar in Bereshit 86a. In the Midrash Rabbah, the Song of Songs 819, it says, The Holy One, blessed be he, does not punish a nation on earth till he has cast down its guardian angel from heaven. This is borne out by five scriptural verses. One, the verse, and it shall come to pass in that day that Yahweh will punish the host of the high heaven on the high, that first, and then the kings of the earth upon the earth in Isaiah twenty four twenty one. The second is, how art thou fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the morning? After which we read, how art thou cut down to the ground? Isaiah 14 and 12. The third is, For my sword hath drunk its fill in heaven, and then below it shall come down upon Edom, in Isaiah 34 and 5. The fourth is, Bind their kings with chains, and then their nobles with the fetters of iron, in Psalms 149 and 8. Explaining which Rabbi Tanhuma said, To bind their kings with chain, this refers to the heavenly princes, and their nobles with the fetters of iron, this refers to the earthly rulers. The fifth is to execute upon them the judgment written, and then he is the glory of all his saints. Hallelujah! In Psalms 149 and 9. So we see this concept of taking care of the things above and the things below, in the spirit realm and in the physical realm. The coming of Messiah and the destruction of Babylon results in the total and final transference of Esau's blessing to Jacob. And again, going to the Zohar. Observe that as soon as Jacob and Esau commits to avail themselves of their blessings, the former possessed everything of his portion on high and the latter of his portion here below. Rabbi Yossi ben Shimon, the son of Lakuna, once said to Rabbi Ele Eleazar, Have you ever heard from your father how it comes about that the blessings given by Isaac to Jacob have not been fulfilled, while those given to Esau have all been fulfilled in their entirety? And Rabbi Eleazar replied, all the blessings are to be fulfilled, including other blessings with which Elohim blessed Jacob. For the time being, however, Jacob took his portion above and Esau here below. But in after time, when the Messiah will arise, Jacob will take both above and below and Esau will lose all, being, lift, being left with no portion of inheritance or remembrance, whatever. So scripture says, and the house of Jacob shall be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame and the house of Esau for stubble in Obadiah 1.18, so that Esau will per perish entirely, while Jacob will inherit both worlds, this world and the world to come. Of that time it is further written, and saviors shall come up on Mount Sion to judge the mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's, in Ob Obadiah 1.21. That is to say, the kingdom which Esau has taken in this world shall revert to Elohim. For although Elohim rules both above and below, yet for the time being he has given it all to the peoples, each a portion and an inheritance in this world. But at that time he will take away dominion from all of them, so that all will be his, as it is written, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. It will be the Lord's alone, as it is further written, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall the Lord be one and his name one. Zechariah 14.9 says the Zohar, Bereshit, section 1. My microphone popped out. So I'll put it in my pocket. The following Midrash connects Esau and his descendants to the ten kings spoken of by Daniel and mentioned later in Revelation. 
Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, Genesis 32 and 12, from the hand of my brother who advances against me with the power of Esau. Thus it is written, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among the other uh, another horn, a little one, in Daniel 7 and 8. This alludes to the son of Nazar, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots, in Daniel 7 and 8. That alludes to Macrinus, Carinus, and Caredes. And behold, in th- this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and mouth speaking great things, Daniel 7 and 8. This alludes to the wicked state, Rome, which imposes levies on all the nations of the world. Rabbi Yohanan said, It is written, As for the ten horns out of the kingdom shall ten kings arise. And these scriptures refers to Esau's descendants. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little horn. This alludes to the wicked state, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. That alludes to the first three empires. And behold, in this horn there were eyes like the eyes of a man. This alludes to the wicked state, which cast an envious eye upon a man's wealth, saying, so and so is wealthy, we will take, make him a city magistrate. And so and so is wealthy, let us make him a counselor. Madras Rabbah, Genesis 76 and 6. She made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. In Midrash Rabbah, Leviticus 13.5, Rabbi Samuel bin Nachman said, All the prophets foresaw the empires engaged in their subsequent activities. This is alluded to in what is written, And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it parted and became four heads. In Genesis 2.10, Rabbi Takuma, and some say Rabbi Menachem, in the name of Rabbi Joshua ben Levi, said, The Holy One, blessed be he, will in the time to come cause the heathen nations to drink the cup of reeling. And this is indicated by what is written, And a river went out of Eden. From the place where judgment, din, edin, is to go forth. Again, Midrash Rabbah, Leviticus 13 and 5. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. Revelation 17 4 and 5. We see it again where uh, this woman <laughs> has been caught again prostituting herself in the world. All we have to do is read the news of today. A spy in the camp told all the money laundering and all of the wickedness that Mystery Babylon has been doing behind our backs in the Vatican. In Jeremiah 25, 15 to 31, it says... This is what Yahweh, the Elohim of Israel, said to me. Take from my hand this cup filled with the wine of my wrath. Make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. When they drink it, they will stagger and go mad because of the sword I will send among them. So I took the cup from Yahweh's hand and made all the nations to whom he sent me drink. Then tell them. This is what Yahweh Almighty, the Elohim of Israel, says. Drink, get drunk, and vomit, and fall to rise no more because of the sword I will send among you. But if they refuse to take the cup from your hand and drink, tell them. This is what Yahweh Almighty says. You must drink it. See, I'm beginning to bring disaster on the city that bears my name. And you will indeed go, will you indeed go unpunished? You will not go unpunished, for I am calling down a sword on all who live upon the earth, declares Yahweh Almighty. Now prophesy all these words against them and say to them, Yahweh will roar from on high. He will thunder from his holy dwelling and roar mightily against his land. He will shout like those who tread the grapes and shout against all who live on the earth. The tumult will resound to the ends of the earth. For Yahweh will bring charges against the nations. He will bring a judgment on all mankind and put the wicked to to the sword, declares Yahweh. Jeremiah 25, 15 through 31. Now see, he's using Mystery Babylon to get the people to drink that cup. You see that? Which is the cup of bitterness, the cup of the adulterous woman. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships a beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or on their hand, they too will drink the wine of Yahweh's fury, which has been poured full strength, not diluted, full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. 
Revelations 14, 9 and 10. Those who align themselves with this Babylonian wine drink the wine of the wrath of Yahweh. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image and for anyone who receives the mark of its name. Revelations 14 and 11. Finally, the sin of taking the mark of the beast carries with it the aspect of it being unforgivable in this world or the next. There are two synonyms which denote eternity. The first is le olam, usually translated as forever, which indicates the end point of the time continuum. Often used is the expression le olam va'ed, which means forever and eternity. The expression eternity here denotes the realm outside the time continuum, where the concept of time does not exist at all. Even in such a timeless domain, however, there is still a kind of hyper time where events can occur in a logical sequence. The Midrash calls such hyper time the order of time. End of quote. The Sefer Yetzria, The Book of Creation by Ari Kaplan. Revelations 14.12 This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of Yahweh who keep His commands and the faith of Yeshua, the Torah and the testimony. This vision is grounded in the Hebraic concept of both keeping Torah and binding oneself to the Zadok, upon whose righteousness, the faith of Yeshua, one is given additional mercy from Yahweh. The commandments of Torah act as the means to both understanding oneself and linking to Yahweh. Now, Rabbi Shimon Lieberman, in his book, Love and Awe, said this, and I quote, Every mitzvah is a bond between man and Elohim. As such, the attitude towards the mitzvah must relate to both these points. Man must find himself in the mitzvah, or the good deed, and he must find Elohim in the mitzvah. Love is the mode of the person finding himself in the mitzvah. Love deed in the commandment. Awe is the mode of finding Elohim in the mitzvah. That's good, isn't it? That's why I'm always telling people, they'll say, well, holy means set apart. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. It means set apart in awe. Set apart in awe. So when you are making something holy... You're setting it apart and then putting the awe of Yahweh in it. In uh, the book Egrot Kodesh by Rabbi Yosef Schneerson, he says this, Mitzvah, commandment, also means companionship or union from the Aramaic Savada, companionship. One who fulfills a commandment becomes united with the essence of Elohim who ordained that precept, end of quote kind of like when your daddy tells you to do something and he sees you trying to fulfill his wish this love just wells up in him because you are mimicking him his morals and his judgments instead of complaining and saying why do we have to do it you're doing it and he sees himself in you well how much if you can do that how much will Yahweh do that with his children In the book, Moshiach, Who, What, Why, How, Where, When, by Chaim Kramer, it says this, and I quote, Furthermore, the river refers to the voice of rebuke. The voice of rebuke is present in the Mashiach, or Messiah, represented by the Zadokim, who reveal the pathways of spirituality. The Torah is that sweet-smelling spice, which emanates from the voice of rebuke, bringing all back to Elohim. The Mashiach, or the Messiah, of each generation, or the Zadokim, are those who draw the power of Edom, prayer, into the garden, Torah, giving forth shape to that which is beyond conception. This is their awesome power, and this is why they can reveal Yah likeness. For they are able to reveal the mitzvot, or the commandments, and advice with which we can relate to Elohim. This is why the Zadokim are called the voice of rebuke, or the river. Cleaving to the Zadokim, to Messiah, is crucial. 
Without it, one cannot hope to combine the aspects of Torah and prayer and thereby come to recognize Elohim. The voice of rebuke is the song of the future. I want you to remember that. The voice of rebuke is the song of the future, which itself corresponds to the revelation of Yahweh's name. End of quote. And then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit. They will rest from their labor and their deeds will follow them. Revelations fourteen thirteen. I was at a funeral of a friend today. And that was quoted by my father at the funeral. And I thought that is so true. When we bind ourselves to Messiah. We know that we are blessed when we die. Submerged in Yahweh and his purpose. I mean. Now, here we appear to have a conversation between the voice of heaven, the bat Kol, and the spirit, the Ruach. And we see a similar dialogue in the Midrash. The voice from heaven issued forth and proclaimed a joyful mother of children in Psalms 1, 13 and 9. And the Holy Spirit cried out, For these things I weep. Midrash Rabbah, Lamentations 1, 50. And their works follow them. Blessed are those that die in the Lord, and their works follow them. As is taught in Judaism, when we stand before Yahweh, all that accompanies us is our good works, those actions that contributed to tikkun, or restoration, of our own souls and of the world. Returning to our text in Revelation 14.14, 14, I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Now, what could this mean? For it is time for judgment to begin with Yahweh's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the full message of Yahweh? First Peter 4.17 So from Revelations 14.14 14 to the end of the chapter, Rabbi Yohanan depicts what seems to be two related but separate judgments. He's not specific as to who makes up these two groups. But let's look at them. The first is in verses 14 through 16. is carried out by what seems to be the Messiah. Second, verses 17 through 20 is carried out by an angel who emerges from the heavenly temple. As opposed to the first judgment where no punishment is mentioned. In the second case... Those reaped are thrown into the winepress of Yahweh. Both Israel and the nations are judged at the time of Messiah's coming. In the Midrash Rabbah, Numbers 2.13, it says, Another interpretation of, as the sands of the sea, what is the nature of sand? If it is put into the fire, it comes out as glass from which utensils can be made. So it is with Israel. They go into fire and come out alive, as it is said. Servants of El Elyon, come out, come here. In Daniel 3.26. In the hereafter, they will enter Gehenna, and the nations of the world will also enter. The latter, having entered, will perish, but Israel will come out therefrom unscathed. As it is said, when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Why? For I, the Lord, thy El, hold thy right hand. Isaiah 41.13. Therefore, he compares them to sand when referred, referring to the hereafter. However, he compares them to stars. As the stars sparkle throughout the firmament, so will they sparkle in the hereafter. As it is said, and they that are wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn the many to righteousness. End of quote. Midrash Rabbah, Numbers 2.13. Yahweh told Moses that his judgment would befall Israel at the end of days. In Deuteronomy 31, it says this, And you are going to rest with your ancestors, and these people will soon prostitute themselves to foreign gods of the land they're entering. They will forsake me and break the covenant I made with them. And in that day, I will become angry with them and forsake them. I will hide my face from them, and they will be destroyed. Many disasters and calamities will come upon them. And in that day, they will ask, Have not these disasters come on us because our Elohim is not with us? And I will certainly hide my face in that day because of all their wickedness in turning to other gods. Now write down this song. Did you hear that? 
write down this song and teach it to the Israelites and have them sing it so that it may be a witness for me against them. When I have brought them into the land flowing with milk and honey, the land I promised on an oath to their ancestors, and when they eat their fill and thrive, they will turn to other gods and worship them, rejecting me and breaking my covenant. And when many disasters and calamities come on them, this song will testify against them because it will not be forgotten by their descendants. I know what they are disposed to do. Even before I bring them into the land, I promise them on an oath. How did you get that? Yahweh still brought them to the land of promise, even though he knew what they were going to do to it. That's like buying your wife a brand new home knowing she's having an affair behind your back. And you still do it because you're that much in love with her. His ways are not our ways, are they? Hmm. The prophet Joel predicts the judgment of the nations. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare war. Stir up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Hasten and come, all you nations, and gather yourselves together around. Cause your mighty ones to come down, O Adonai. Let the nations be stirred up and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the nations around. Put in the sickle. Oh, there it is. Put in the sickle. Who's going to put the sickle in? Messiah. For the harvest is ripe. Come, tread down. For the press is full. The vats overflow. For their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon are darkened and the stars withdraw their shining. And Adonai roars out of Sion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shake, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people and a fortress for the people of Israel. And you shall know that I am Yahweh your Elohim dwelling in Sion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy and no stranger shall pass through her any more. Joel 3 9 through 17. Now the Midrash differentiates the reasons that Yahweh will punish the nations and Israel. In the Midrash Rabbah in the book about the book of Ruth it says this, the vengeance taken of the idolatrous nations will be on account of Israel, while the vengeance taken of Israel will be on account of their poor. The vengeance taken of the idolatrous nations will be on account of Israel as it is said and I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel. Ezekiel 25, 14. The vengeance taken of Israel will be on account of their poor, as it is written, and he cry unto Yahweh against thee, and it will be a sin in thee. Deuteronomy 15 and 9. Rabbi Abun said, The poor man stands at your door, and the Holy One, blessed be he, stands at his right hand. If you give unto him, he who stands at the right hand will bless you. But if he will exact judgment if but if not he will exact punishment upon you as it is written because he standeth at the right hand of the needy in psalms 119:31 midrash raba ruth 5 and 9 in the midrash raba of the book of lamentations it says yahweh hath set at naught sila all my mighty men he hath made me like refuge before them now rabbi rabbi abba ben kahana said in Bar Gamza, they call refuse salata. Rabbi Levi Sai said, or excuse me, Rabbi Levi said, in Arabia they call a comb misela, misela sela. He hath called a solemn assembly against me to crush my young men. We find that the death of the youth is considered a grievous as the destruction of the temple. For it is written, Yahweh hath trodden as in a winepress the virgin daughter of Judah. And in the same way, he hath called a solemn assembly against me to crush my young men. Midrash Rabbah, Lamentations 144. Now, over here, it said, And I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the white cloud was one like a son of man. So who is this son of man? Now, the popular claim has, has it that Yeshua was referring to himself in the third person. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man 
will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of Yahweh has come with power. Daniel describes the Son of Man as riding on the clouds of heaven to the Ancient of Days. I looked, and there before me was one like a Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Daniel seven thirteen and 14. Revelation's description of the Son of Man fits. The pattern of stars in the constellation Orion or Gibor, the warrior. The Son of Man has a cluster of stars in the background that looks like the clouds upon which the Son of Man rides. Astronomical maps show the Milky Way behind the constellation Orion. From Earth, they look like clouds. Orion, as seen in human form, his right hand could be holding a sickle or a club. The arc above him represents the sun's path. There it is, without the lines. The heavens declare the glory of Elohim. The skies proclaim the works of his hands, says Psalms 19 and 1. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from him. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. The heavens Elohim has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of heaven and makes its circuit to another. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. Psalms 19, 2 through 6. So this, we see then this story being acted out in the heavens as well as in the scripture. The law of Yahweh is perfect. Psalms 19, 7 through 11 says. The law or the Torah of Yahweh is perfect, complete. Converting the soul, the testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes or pechut of Yahweh are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment or the mitzvah of Yahweh is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear, Yaira, of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. The judgment, the mishpat of Yahweh are true or emet, and righteous altogether, yechad. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Echav. Echav. Excuse me. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sin. May they not rule over me, then I will be blameless Innocent of great transgression. Psalms 19, 12 through 13. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Yahweh, my rock and my redeemer, says Psalms 19 and 14. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now this is not talking about evangelism. This is talking about vengeance and death. When this son of man puts his sickle to the ground, it's not going to be pleasant. So he who sitteth on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Revelations 14, 15 through 16. Another reason to consider that the first judgment by way of the messianic figure in verse 15 involves Israel and the second by way of an angel is that of the nations is the following concept. In regards to death outside Eretz Israel, it is accomplished by the angel of death, whereas in Israel it comes about via a holy force or the Holy Spirit. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle. Take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grape from the earth's vine because its grapes are ripe. Revelations 14, 7 through 18. Yahweh's vengeance upon the nations 
is specifically linked to the coming of Messiah. That day will be a day of note, both above and below, as it is written, and there shall be one day which shall be known as Yahweh's, Zechariah 14.7. That day will be the day of vengeance, the day which the Holy One, blessed be He, has appointed for taking vengeance on the idolatrous nations. For whilst the Holy One is taking vengeance on the idolatrous nation, He will make a man more precious than gold, to which the Messiah, who will be raised and glorified above all mankind, and to whom all mankind will pay homage and bow down, as it is written, before him those that dwell in the wilderness will bow down, the kings of Tarshish and the isles shall render tribute, in Psalm 72, 9 through 10. Observe that although this prophecy in the book of Isaiah was primarily intended for Babylonia, yet it has a general application, since this section commences with the words, When Yahweh shall have mercy upon Jacob. And it is also written, and people shall take them and bring them to their place. In the Zohar, Bereshit 107 and B. Notice that when Yahweh judges the nations, he will have mercy upon Israel or Jacob. Jacob is the name of unregenerated Israel, where Israel is regenerated Jacob. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress, of Yahweh's wrath. Revelations 14 and 19. Concerning this in the Talmud it says. Rabbi Jeremiah ben Abba said. The wine, the vine is Israel. For so it is written. Thou didst pluck up a vine out of Egypt. The three branches are the three festivals. On which Israel goes up to the temple every year. And as it was budding. The time has come for Israel to be fruitful and to multiply. For so it is written, and the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly. Its blossoms shot forth. The time is come for Israel to be redeemed. For so it is written, and their life blood is dashed against my garments, and I have stained all my raiment. And the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. The time is come for Egypt to drink the cup of staggering. And this is in accordance with that which Rabbah had said. Why are three cups mentioned in connection with Egypt? One refers to the cup which she drank in the days of Moses, the other to that which she drank in the days of Pharaoh Necho, and the third is that which she was destined to drink together with all the nations. Rabbi Abba said to Rabbi Jeremiah ben Abba, Then Rav expounded this verse in an, an agotic literature. He expounded it as you have done. Rabbi Shimon ben Lachish said, The people Israel is like unto a vine. Its branches are aristocracy. It clusters the scholars. It leaves the common people, its twigs, those in Israel, that are void of learning. And this is what was meant when the word was sent forth there in Palestine. Let the clusters pray for the leaves. For were it not for the leaves, the clusters could not exist. End of quote. Rabbi Hulin, or excuse me, Talmud Hulin, 92a. The great wine press. This is a concept that's morbid and exciting all the same he's going to throw them into the great wine press of his wrath in the midrash rabba of the book of lamentations it says rabbi hananiah opened his discourse with this text though i would take comfort against sorrow my heart is faint within me jeremiah eight eighteen. now this term comfort is mid Legida, Legidi. Because there are none, Mibli, who meditate, Hogim, in the Torah to perform divine precepts and meritorious acts, I have made my house into my wine press. A giddy, a wine press. Hmm. So when he says that he's going to throw them into the wrath of his wine press, is that talking about the vengeance against his temple? Midrash Rabbah, Lamentations, Prologue 32. In Isaiah 63 it says, Who is this who comes from Edom in crimson garments from Basra? And we know Basra is the ancient name of Petra. This one who is glorious in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength, I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save, why is your apparel red and your garments like his who tramples in the winepress? I have trampled the winepress alone, and the people there 
was none with me, for I have trampled them in my anger and trampled them in my fury, and their blood was sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my clothing. That's splatter, isn't it? For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. Notice that's the same time. The day of vengeance and the year of my redeemed. That's you and I. Has come. And I looked, and there was none to help me. I was appalled that there was none to uphold. Therefore my own arm brought salvation to me, and my fury upheld me. And I trampled down the people in my anger, and I made them drunk in my fury, and I poured out their life's blood to the earth. Isaiah 63, 1 through 6. Now why was there no one to help him? Because we're in Petra. And by this time, the righteous that would have helped him are dead. Mm. Now the Zohar connects Messiah to this judgment. He hath washed his garments in wine. With this may be compared the verse, Who is this that comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? In Isaiah 63, 1. And also, I have trodden the winepress alone. Wine here alludes to the side of Giburah, or the side of justice, of stern justice, which will be visited on the idolatrous nations. And his vesture is in the blood of the grape. This is the lower world tree, the judgment court, which is called grapes, in which the wine is kept. Thus the Messiah will be clothed in both to crush beneath him all the idolatrous peoples and kings, says Zohar Bereshit 238a. Again in the Zohar. He hath washed his garments in wine, even from the time of creation, the reference being to the coming of Messiah on earth. Wine indicates the left side, the, the blood of grapes, the, the left side below, the, that's the side of justice. The Messiah is destined to rule above all over all the forces of the idolatrous nations and to break their power above and below. We may also explain that as wine brings joyfulness and yet typifies judgment, so the Messiah will bring gladness to Israel, but judgment to the Gentiles, says the Zohar Bereshit 239b and 240a. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city and blood flowed out of the press rising as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 strata, or about 180 miles. That's almost the full length of Israel. So that means it's flowing from Dan all the way to Elat, down the Jordan River Valley. Revelations 14.30. That means he's going to unstop the tributary, the south tributary from the Dead Sea, all the way to a lot that's dry now, but you can see in an aerial view that it used to be flowing. Now this is from the Midrash Rabbah on Lamentations again. Rabbi Jordan, Juden asked Rabbi Aha, where did Israel slay Zechariah in the court of women or in the court of Israel? He replied, in neither of these, but it was in the court of the priest, nor did they treat his blood as was done with the blood of the high hind or ram of which it is written he shall pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust but in this instance they set it upon the bare rock and for what purpose was all this that it might cause fury to come up that vengeance might be taken i have set her blood upon the bare rock that it should not be covered seven transgressions were committed by israel on that day they killed a priest a prophet a judge they shed innocent blood, they profaned the divine name, they defiled the temple court, and all this was done on the Sabbath, which was also the Day of Atonement. When Nebuzaradan came up against Israel, the blood began to seethe, so he asked them, What kind of blood is this? They replied, The blood of bulls, rams, and lambs, which we slay. He immediately set, sent and had some blood of sacrificial lambs brought to him, but it did not behave similarly. He said to them, If you tell me well and good, otherwise I will comb your flesh with iron combs. They replied, What shall we say to you? He was a prophet who, rep who reproved us. So we rose against him and killed him. And for several years now his blood has not stopped seething. He answered, I will appease it. They brought before him the men of the great Sanhedrin and minor Sanhedrin and slew them until their blood mingled with the blood of Zechariah to fulfill that which was said, they break all bounds and blood touches blood. Hosea 4 and 2. 
The blood, however, continued to the sea, so they brought youths and maidens and slew them by it, and still it didn't stop. They brought school children and slew them by it, and it still didn't stop. Then they brought 80,000 priests, priestly novites, and he slew them until their blood mingled with that of Zechariah, and still it continued to see. He exclaimed, Zechariah, Zechariah, all the choices of them have I destroyed. Is it your pleasure that I exterminate them all? As soon as he spoke this, it stopped. Thereupon he, de he debated with himself whether to repent, saying, If such vengeance is exacted for one life, how much more will happen to me for having taken so many lives? He fled and sent a parting gift to his household and became a convert to Judaism. End of quote. Idrash Rabbah, Lamentations Prologue 23. So Yahweh takes seriously the blood of his saints and he's bringing vengeance on the house of Yahweh first and then upon the idolatrous nations that brings us to chapter 15 I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign seven angels with the seven last plagues last because with them Yahweh's wrath is completed revelations 15 and 1 with the spiritual worlds of Berea and Yetzria having been dealt with by the other trumpets and other judgments. It's now time for the final phase of Tekhun, or restoration of creation. And this time of the world, the spiritual world of Asiyah, which is the physical earth. It's interesting to note that Tekhun is an Aramaic word, meaning both rectification and warfare. That's why the theme of Ephesians 6, 10-18 We've read this many times, but have you really understood it? This is talking about putting on the armor of Yahweh in the time of vengeance. Finally, be strong in Yahweh and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of Yahweh so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Now remember, he heats up the battle when he sees that his days are short. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of Yahweh so that when the day of evil or the day of wrath comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth, Torah is the truth, buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in its place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, or shalom, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of Yahweh. That's the Torah again. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert, and always keep on praying for all of Yahweh's people. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Now, you may not realize that, but that was a whole lot of spiritual warfare going on right there. We've got to know how to do spiritual warfare during the days of vengeance. Yahweh is dealing, and he's, this judgment falls above and below. There is an integral relationship between the spiritual and physical realms in that events of in one not only impact the other but that which will occur in the physical realm has already been ordained in the upper spiritual realm or the world of Berea again appealing to the Zohar observe that Yahweh has made the earthly kingdom after the pattern of the heavenly kingdom and whatever whatever is done on earth has been preceded by a prototype in heaven says Zohar Bereshit section 1 the idea is expressed by drawing down the perfection of the world of Atzilut into the physical realm doing tikkun or repairing of the lower worlds. The essence of the world of Asiyah is action. The story of creation concludes with the words that Elohim made to do or to rectify. <coughs> the word to do in Hebrew is leasot. And it's derived from the same word as Asiyah, action. This world is created for the sake of action, which means rectification. The near-perfect state of rectification of the world of absolute needs to be drawn down into this world too. 
The world is created incomplete. What it, what it is lacking is revelation of righteousness that is found to greater or lesser extent in the supernal or spiritual worlds. The rectification of Asiyah is the revelation of righteousness in this world through the actions of men. He's called us to bring down the glory. And that's why the altar in Egypt. Remember it said in that day an altar will be at the border and in the midst of Egypt. Notice the shape of that altar. It's the shape of a pyramid. Bringing down the glory of Yahweh like a mighty river. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire and standing beside the sea. Those who had been victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name. Revelations 15 and 2. So this is a, by this crystal river that's now glowing with fire. Are those that are victorious over the beast, the image and over the number of the name. We didn't take it. We had the victory. Now going to the book of Enoch, chapter 14. Behold, in a vision, clouds invited me and amidst summoned me, and the course of the stars and the lightning sped and hastened me. And the winds in the vision caused me to fly and lifted me upward and bore me into heaven. And I went in till I drew nigh to a wall which is built of crystals and surrounded by tongues of fire. And it began to affright me. And I went into the tongues of fire and drew nigh to the large house which was built of crystals. And the walls of the house were like tessellated floor or made of crystals. And its groundwork was like was of crystal. And its ceiling was like the path of the stars and the lightnings. And between them were fiery cherubim. And, their hev- and the heaven was clear as water. As flaming fire surrounded the walls and its portals blazed with fire. And I entered into that house and it was hot as fire and cold as ice. There were no delights of life therein. I Fear covered me and trembling got hold of me. And as I quaked and trembled, I fell upon my face and I beheld a vision. And lo, there was a second house, greater than the former. And the entire portal stood open before me. And it was built of flames of fire. And in every respect, it, also, it so excelled in splendor and magnificence and extent that I could not describe to you its splendor and, ex- and its extent. And its floor was a fire. And above it were lightnings and paths of stars, and its ceiling also was flaming fire. And I looked, and I saw therein a lofty throne. Its appearance was a crystal, and the wheels thereof as the shining sun. And there was the vision of the Keravim. And from underneath the throne came streams of flaming fire, so that I could not look thereon. And the great glory sat thereon, and his raiment shone more brightly than the sun, and was whiter than any snow. None of the angels could enter and could behold his face by reason of the magnificence and glory, and no flesh could behold him. The flaming fire was round about him, and the great fire stood before him, and none around could draw nigh to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, yet he needed no counselor. And the most holy ones who were nigh to him did not leave by night nor depart from him, until then I had been prostrate on my face trembling. And the Lord called me with his own mouth and said to me, Come hither, Enoch. And hear my word. And one of the holy ones came to me and waked me. And he made me rise up and approach the door. And I bowed my face downwards. It says Enoch 14, 8 through 25. So this river that's coming out of the throne of Yahweh is like a fire. And those who have victory against the beast and all the mark and the number, they avoid the punishment of the angels. They that lack the mark of the beast is directly tied to the judgment placed in the hands of the seven angels. The Zohar states that such a mark, good or bad, is used by the angels to identify those who are judged. Reminiscent of the ten plagues of Egypt where the doors are to be marked. In the Zohar, Bereshit, it says, The fact is that angels do not know of happenings in this world save what is necessary for their mission. This is borne out by the text, For I will pass through the land of Egypt. I am the Lord, or actually I am Yahweh, Exodus 12 and 12, which indicates that although the Holy One had many messengers and angels to perform His work, yet they would not have been able to distinguish between the germ of the firstborn and the latterborn. Only the Almighty Himself could do this. Another example is the verse, and set a mark upon their foreheads of men, in Ezekiel 9, 4, which proves that the angels require a mark 
as otherwise they only know what is specifically communicated to them. As, for instance, the sufferings which the Holy One is about to bring upon the world as a whole and which he proclaims throughout the seven heavens. Zohar Bereshit 101b to 102a. So what he's saying is, the reason why these marks are important is it identifies for the angels who are for Yahweh and who's against Yahweh. They are not omniscient. They don't know everything. No more than we know everything. We have to be communicated to, and so they do. Now, Rabbi Yohanan, here in the Revelation, he has a four-part description, may be as follows. Absolute, the image, reciprocal to the image of Yahweh, existing prior to creation. This also can allude to the world of Asiyah, as found in the base image of a physical idol, as depicted in Revelations chapter 13, on a literal level. This is consistent with the Kabbalistic concept of the beginning being embedded in the end, in the Sefer Yetzriah. Next, the Berea, the number, the numbers being the foundation of creation, the gematria of the Hebrew letters as well as the mathematics to modern physics, like the string theory. Also, the number of the beast requiring understanding in Revelations 13.18, Bana, which is associated with Berea. Next is Yetzriah, the mark. Here the mark being the identifier for the angels of Yetzriah as depicted above. What is truly marked is a person's soul, again in the world of Yetzriah. Lastly is Asiyah, corresponding to the beast. Again, this may be viewed as the physical person as well as the sense of the absolutic beast. Now what is all that? What we're saying is all of these things that we're victorious of can be found in the four worlds. Okay? Having said this, this fourfold description corresponds in the negative sense to the Messiah, who is also viewed across the four worlds. Absolute, the name, the image of Messiah pre existing in the world of creation of Berea. So says the Talmud, Pesachim 54a. Berea, the Lamb in the throne, the high priest at the right hand of the Father, in the world of glory. And Yetzria, the mediator between Yahweh and man. And then Asiyah speaks of the earthly ministry of Messiah. So the Messiah existed on all four, in all four worlds. They held harps given them by Yahweh and sang the song of Yahweh's servant, Moses, and of the Lamb, in Revelations 15 and 3. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Yahweh Elohim. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Yahweh, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed, says Revelations 15, 3-4. This is uniquely the song. All this, the song comes from the phrases in other songs. The songs found in Psalms 111, 2 and 3, Deuteronomy 32 and 4, Jeremiah 10 and 7, and Psalms 86, 9 and 98, 2. Now the Zohar says, Moses and the children of Israel will sing this song. This same is implied in the words, as in the days of thy going out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto them marvelous things. Micah 7.15 Where the hymn refers to Moses. Also I will show him the salvation of Elohim. In Psalms 50.24 I will show him my salvation. In Psalms 91.16 Moses and the children of Israel will then sing this song unto Yahweh, the wedding song to the Holy One, blessed be he. We have been taught that everyone who sings this hymn daily with true devotion will be worthy to sing it at the redemption that is to be. For it refers to both the past world and the future world. It contains confirmations of faith and mysteries relating to the days of Messiah. The Shekinah will sing this song to the Lord, because the king will receive her with radiant countenance. Rabbi Yossi said that the Shekinah will praise Yahweh for all the concentration of light and holiness which the Holy One shall direct towards her. Said Rabbi Yehuda, if this is the song of the Shekinah, why does it say that Moses and the children of Israel sang it? Because were they, blessed were they, that they knew, say blessed were they, that they knew how to praise him for all the power and might which the Shekinah received and shall receive from him the Holy King. According to Rabbi Abba, the singing is to be directed not to any of the emanations of deity, but to the Holy King in his very essence, as it says, concerning the song of Moses and the children of Israel, that they sang to Yahweh. Rabbi Yossi said that these words, this song to the Lord, refers to the river that issues forth from Eden. In Genesis 2.10, that same river 
that crystal sea that we see f- that we're standing by with flames of fire from which all the abundance of oil issues to kindle the lights. Whereas the words I will sing unto Yahweh refer to the supernal holy king. End of quote. Zohar Shemot 54 A and B. I got three minutes, huh? Well, go back to the Zohar then. Rabbi Shimon said, what is the most perfect hymn? One that is dressed both by the lower and to the higher, and by the higher to the lower, and which combines the two. From whose example do we know this? From the song of Moses. First the lower dresses the higher in the words, for I will call in the name of Yahweh, and, and again ascribe greatness to our Elohim. The reference being to the Most High King. Afterwards, he traces the degrees from higher to lower, as it is written, righteous and upright. Finally, the knot of faith is tied in the words, He is. This should be the example of every man in arranging the praises of his master. At first, he should ascend from the lower to the higher till he carries the honor of his master to the place whence issues the streams of the most recondite fountain. Then he draws it downwards from that moistening stream to each grade, in turn down to the lowest grade so that blessings are drawn to all from on high. Then he has to knit all firmly together with the knot of faith, and this is the man who honors the name of his master by unifying the Holy One. Of such a one is it written, Them that honor me I will honor, 1 Samuel 2 and 30. That is, them that honor me in this world will I honor in the next. But the verse goes on, They that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. What does Yeshua say? If you're ashamed of me here, I'll be ashamed of you there. This applies to one who does not know how to unify the Holy Name to bind the knot of faith, and to bring blessing to the proper place. For whoever does not know how to honor the name of his master, were better not to have been born. Says the Zohar Davarim 285a. Two minutes still? Well, we'll stay it there. And we'll pick it up at Revelations 15, 5 next week. Wasn't that good? Do we have any questions about what we studied tonight what is the binding of not a faith well when you're climbing well it sure can uh, allude to that or that that alludes to this when you are climbing a knotted ladder what do you do as you ascend up that that rope you tie a knot in it so that you don't fall any further back down 